This is Performance Anxiety on the Pantheon Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Mark. And if you listen to this podcast, you're most likely a fan of music. And chances are you've seen a live concert. Have you ever wondered what goes into getting a band from one show to the next? What kind of pre-planning is needed? And how much more has to go into an overseas tour? Well, my guest and friend Chris Bergstrom joins me to give us all a taste of what it takes to make a tour successful and how that process has changed over the years. He's worked with some incredible acts like Black Rebel Motorcycle Club and the Dandy Warhols, but he's also worked with acts I wasn't expecting, like the Oregon Symphony Orchestra and country music star Tracy Lawrence. He's done everything from load-ins and load-outs to front of house to tour management. He's got great behind-the-scenes stories as well as a collection of live recordings that I would kill for. But it's not all sex, drugs, and rock and roll. In fact, that stereotype has changed a lot over the years. But for many, the hardest part is still acclimating to post-tour or normal life. Chris is candid about all of it. So if you want to follow his touring exploits, check him out at Black Eyed P-R-O-D on Instagram. Follow us at Performance A-N-X on Instagram and Twitter. And you can show us some love through ko-fi.com slash performance anxiety or with a merchandise purchase at performanceanx.threadless.com. Now prepare for an insider's look at touring with Chris Bergstrom on Performance Anxiety, part of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Performance Anxiety, Performance Anxiety Podcast. Yeah, you can stumble over that a little bit yeah. if you're not careful. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, hey, guys, this is Chris with Black Rebel Motorcycle Club, and you're listening to Performance Anxiety Podcast. That was perfect. We'll do that. So, there we go. Uh, so I'm getting, I'm getting almost so the next entire... ten would be off. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I reached out to to Leah to let her know you were coming on, and uh, she said to say hi from you and Pete. Uh, nice. Say hi Very to nice. you from her and Pete. My brain. Is yeah, they're in the middle of uh, the worst thing in the world, which is moving. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> she's telling God. me. Oh, I hate I, and everyone knows that pain. The second someone says I'm in the middle of moving, we all get that gut stomach feeling. Go, uh, oh, I'm oh, sorry. I feel for you. Yeah. yeah, it's like a universal. I mean, I guess unless you're lean enough to pack up your stuff, but I'm not that. So I get to pack all my own stuff up, put it in a vehicle like, yeah, normal people. Yep. Uh, it's when I always wish that my stuff lived in road cases because it would be so much easier. Just lives uh, in, strap it off, done. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I know it. It's... We moved in here five, six years ago, something like that, or no, seven at this point. And uh, once the kids are gone, we might move one more time just to get a slightly smaller place. But I, by the time we do that, I want to be able to pay somebody to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) I was ready to do it this last time. I moved in about a year and a half ago to this place. It was like, I took over a lease for a buddy's because he bought a house. So it worked out great. Uh, so the overlap happened over like a month. Originally, I was like, we're going to do it one day and I'm going to hire some movers. Well, the overlap kind of got to me because I could slowly bring stuff over. Yeah. And by the time, still even up to the last day, I was like, oh, I'm going to have somebody move the heavy stuff. And then it came down to like, kind of like, I need one friend to help me for one hour. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> never mind. All right. So I, yeah, so I didn't this time either. But yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, oh. we, we, I had this actually same thing happen when we bought this place. So, this, but everyone hates moving. Uh, is the moral of that story. So uh, I, I have before, before we get rolling into things, I have one question because I haven't opened this yet. And with your connection you to the band, have you oh, had you got some? Yes. Yes. So we had a case on that tour that we were keeping like, you know, quiet. Well, for a couple of reasons, like you know, there's some, we could give away whatever we wanted, but if you get told you can't sell any of it, you know, there's all sorts of legalities of that. Oh yeah. There was discussions of trying to get the venues to carry it as we went, which is a cool idea. Yeah. That became this wild set of uh, issues. Right. And, and so fair enough. So what we did get was uh, in Chicago. Up ahead, sorry. It was a text from a guy where he's always working. Right. So I work for a sound company right. when I'm not on the road and I, you know, I'm the operation manager there and there's, there's always something going on, whether I'm there or not. Oh, yeah. One guy's at the shop looking for some gear. Uh, no worries, so, man. Uh, Work comes first. Uh, I can't find anyone. Oh, yeah, he'll find it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we had some of that whiskey. Yes. And it was like, all right, keep it all careful. The guy, that, the distillery guy is in Chicago, I think. He, he came to the show, really cool, brought the whole team. Brought us some of his other stuff, too, whatever. So then it was like, all right, well, let's keep these bottles for specific things. And then, like. And no one knows where they're at. Oh, I don't know. I didn't give any out. You know, everybody rolled their eyes sideways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The case in the back. I was like, hmm, nice one. Nice one. So I, but I did, we opened one one night after everything was done. 
like maybe Chicago because it was with that with the distiller and uh, the the woman and I'm forgetting both their names terribly. Uh, they're really nice, really yeah. cool people. Um, but the one lady, she's a massive fan of the band even before the idea ever came up to do a thing for them. And she yeah. was instrumental in making it and stuff. And so, yeah, it was great. Uh, and it's, if you haven't opened it yet, Not it's yet. Uh, no joke. It's no joke. That's, <laughs> it I'm, definitely is its namesake. I'm yeah. dying to, but I want to take some photos. Uh, I love the packaging. So I want to take some photos. I know. Because yeah, absolutely. I don't even want to break open the Celia because it's got that beautiful piston seal. I on know. It. I was joking with the guy. I was like, he should distribute it to the UK and call it like synthetic motor oil. Yeah. You know, keep the theme going would be hilarious. Uh, <laughs> I was like, ah, oh. I've got another friend uh, who makes whiskey or makes unrelated to that. But a friend of mine makes a brand of vodka called backdrop, uh, which is related to music. He was a roadie. We worked together years ago and then he jumped out and got into the family business of distilleries and breweries and so on. And so he made this backdrop vodka. It's wow. incredible. Uh, uh, so, but yeah, and it's got some cool packaging as well and stuff. And yeah. I, I On love, a side note that, and a shameless plug for my friend's distillery oh, in yeah. Oregon. Uh, Backdrop Distillery is totally worth checking out. Oh, they make a gin as well. They make a few oh, other things. but God. Mm -hmm. I do shows at the big amp. There's a Live Nation venue there. And the sound company worker handles them. And he lives in that town. So he'll come down and see me and stuff. And he's always relenting. You know, oh, I miss doing roadie work. I'm like, yeah, man. I mean, you're running a distillery that's doing very well. So don't miss it too much. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Man, I yeah. swear, I wish I, I would love a family business to fall back on, right? It was like 15 years ago that we worked <laughs> together. We've stayed in touch ever since. But there's three of us that worked there at that time at this sound company, small sound company in Bend, Oregon. Okay. Three of us. A guy named Nate. Uh, his name is Mark as well. And then myself. So Nate is the band manager for Old Dominion. So he's doing well for himself. Wow. And Mark runs a distillery and a brewery that are doing exceptionally well for themselves. <laughs> and then I'm still a roadie. So between <laughs> the three of us, I think we all, uh, yeah, those three, those two made some really good decisions. Uh, yeah, well, you're working with some pretty awesome people, though. Yeah, I'm doing, I like what I'm doing as well. It's funny. But yeah, it's, <laughs> and Nate came through with Old Dominion one time recently. I was like, hey, come on, man, start loading the stuff in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the perks, man. It's all about making connections. Yep. So, so. And that's why I am just, I'm, I'm actually dying for BRMC to hit the road again because I've, Same. I've Same. worked out a, actually a better way to do photos. So when you think for my, you know, uh, for the equipment that I had, I, I figured a couple things out to make them a lot better and a lot crisper and sharper. So I, I liked what I shot when I was there at, in Pittsburgh. But I know I can do a whole hell of a lot better at well, now. I really like the stuff you shot in Pittsburgh, man. That was some really good work. Yeah, I appreciate that. That was Thank a good you. show. That was a really fun show. That was. I, I and I, I got uh, I got the heads up to make sure that I stay hidden. I have a similar thing when I'm mixing. If anyone's, you know, because it's common to have people out in front of the house with you. I mean, yeah. notably, it'd be irritating that people ask you questions the whole time you're mixing or whatever to distract oh, yeah. you. But even if they're in my peripheral kind of thing like right in the left right it just kind of makes me constantly be doing this oh really? and it drives me crazy and so yeah i'll have to ask people to be like i know it sounds like i'm being a dick but can you like you know back behind me or you know way off the side or something because yeah. it's just distracting so i fully understand yeah it's, it's not that he hates those people by any means he's such a nice guy it's, yeah. just, it's, it's a weird thing for him and i could i couldn't fathom trying to do my job while somebody's holding a camera right in my face like i, I get it exactly yeah, so and that's why I, I try to stay it, it being a short guy i'm five foot six you know and if i wear <laughs> dark clothes i can be fairly inconspicuous when I'm shooting around, especially if I'm in the audience shooting around with black clothes, I got my, my yep. camera's black, everything black, everything. Well, we went to Portugal not long after that, which is an epic show. Yeah, oh, I, love I Portugal. heard about that. on a fun little run i did a couple shows at dandy warhols and then took five days off in barcelona and then jumped over to portugal uh, it was great wow. uh, so nobody had said anything about it I, I checked on the cameras i knew they were robotic cameras okay great because you know far sides and wait for the house should yeah. be no problem because they had big screens and it was a huge festival i think 20,000 people or something so even cameras were needed at that point right i mean oh, yeah. 
totally understandable. So great, we sort all that. And the day's going on, the other bands are playing, because we're direct support Simple Minds that day. Uh, right, so we're right. going along, we're going along. And when it, it gets darker and everything's really happening, somebody mentions there's a drone, and I was like, yeah, it's probably somebody flying a drone, right? And I walked up on stage to see, no, like, I shit you not, like, maybe 12 feet out, and right in front of the artist is a video drone. I mean, like, if you had a long enough stick, you could have hit it. And it was, you know, following the artist up and down and back. And it was creepy. Oh, I mean, nice. it looked cool on camera. It looked cool, on the, on, you know, up on the screens, of oh, course. sure, yeah. But from the artist's perspective, you know, like a snake just moving its head around, following you. And there's some dudes running it in a van, you know, off the side. Yeah. Uh, you've got multiples of them. You know, like, it, it's totally <laughs> legit. But, I mean, you could just see Pete. I was like, no, 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 no. Well, um, and come to find out, we weren't the only ones that didn't like it. Placebo didn't want it the night before, and yeah. others. So it was no hard feelings. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy works. But what is therapy exactly? It's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships or at work, not dealing well with the stress. Whatever you need, it's time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles and start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Try doing that in person. So join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And a special offer to Performance Anxiety listeners, you can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash performanceanxiety. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash performance anxiety. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. That has uh, got to be so distracting when you're an artist. To have oh, can to you sit- I mean, it's not even far away. It'd be one thing if you know, it was way out above the crowd yeah. and whatever. But, I mean, it was close. Yeah, <laughs> you could have hit it with a water bottle. No yeah. problem. <laughs> yeah, because things all have blinking <laughs> Which, lights on them and all. Mm-hmm. It's just floating there, staring at you, blinking at you. That's, oh, I wouldn't yeah, like that. Nope. So they didn't mind. They didn't care. We said no. And I guess so did Simple Minds because it didn't go back up. So. Oh, yeah. wow. Oh, that's good. That's yeah, good. Yeah, so, yeah. So, man, so. I, I would have killed to have seen this. Simple Minds, man. That's am- opening up for Simple Minds. They, that's they've, awesome. They've still got it, by the way. Oh. Uh, in every way. Uh, and they've got a new drummer. Uh, I don't remember her name, but they guess the other drummer. I heard this, this crazy story about the original drummer started playing in a, in a Simple Minds cover band during COVID. Oh. <laughs> and I, I mean, I guess a lot of this is somewhat true, and I'm sure the details are becoming embellished, but uh, it came up at this show, right? Because he'd been with them forever. He's original. Yeah. But I guess he wasn't a songwriter. And so during COVID, without touring money, he was going broke like everybody else. And so he started playing with this band, and then all five. But then when everything came back, he was still playing with this band. I, and as far as the band pulled him aside and was like, man, you can't be in a cover band and in this band. And he was like... <laughs> <laughs> well, I need the money, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they yeah. weren't touring much. And so he stayed with the cover band. And wow. to this day, he's with the cover band. It gets a bunch of press, of course, because he's the original drummer and oh, yeah. and so on. And he's going to make a living. So then they just got somebody else. That's <laughs> like, crazy. Okay. I mean, sure. <laughs> yeah, money, you know, you got to eat. So Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, and I know Simple Minds ain't hit it hard, right? They were doing like three months total. Yeah. Like, okay. Well, that doesn't pay the bills for somebody. So, yeah. That's cr- oh my god. They were awesome, and you know the infamous, famous song "Don't Forget About Me," uh, which I mean, it was record perfect. It, arguably oh. better than a record. I wow. mean, I walked out in front of the house for a second. I was like, "Wow!" I mean, just awesome. Yeah. yeah. And Black Rebel was well received. Everybody loved them. The band played really well. That, um, it, that's such a strange pairing to me, though. I would never have pictured BRMC opening for Simple Minds because I didn't honestly. I didn't even know Simple Minds was still touring. Right. I had no idea. I mean, when I saw him on the roster, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. I guess they're still around. Yeah. Um, the, the festival lineup changed a bunch. And like uh, Wolf Mother canceled their whole European tour right before that, including a date there. Oh. Uh, and they were supposed to be on the bill. And then 
Limp Biscuit was supposed to be on the bill. I'm very happy that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that would have bummed me out no uh, in a bunch of ways. And not to mention, I just got done watching that Woodstock 99 doc. Oh, so I was like, I, I don't really yet. want to associate Limp Biscuit at a festival uh, of large scale <laughs> right now. So that didn't hurt my feelings at all. I mean, it hurts the promoter, right? Because he had that, but you know, yeah. he was a massive fan of Beer MC. Uh, so yeah, it was stoked. He was trying to play it cool the whole time, and I mean, he, he came out. Stage manager came out. Everybody came out to front of house to watch our set and wow. go back. And, yeah, I, so yeah, I was just going back through some of the catalog recently. So I'm relatively new to the camp. Um, aware of them in the same spheres and mutual friends across the bands and mutual management. That's how yeah. I even was originally introduced. Um, but um, when we were in Michigan, we met a guy from Apple. Uh, he was a big fan, came out, said hi to the band and whatnot. Cool. Uh, and we were just discussing some stuff, and it came up the fact that you couldn't, up until just recently, stream Howl anywhere. Um, and it was some licensing oh, wow. problem and whatnot, and a few little details got sorted out. And it all of a sudden just popped up, actually suggested it to me in my title. It was like, hey, I think you'd like this. And I was like, yes, yes, I, I would. You- <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and so I was re-going re- re- back through it. Uh, and I was texting Rob and give him a bad time. Like, Man, you guys used to be able to write some songs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great stuff. Uh, but uh, actually, I really like it. was one that was in True Detective. It was because uh, I was like, Man, I have heard this song. It oh. sounds like a cover, but it's not a cover. It is Fault Line. Is that what it is? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Tra- yeah. Fault Line. Yeah. Wow. I mean, just a real, I mean, I'm a sucker for a anthemic bad company style arena ballad, right? Just, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. And it really falls into that category. I was yeah. like, well, we should really bring that back into the mix. You know, all that stuff comes back around. I'll tell you what I would love to hear them do live, which I, I think I've seen on a couple old, old set lists. I would kill to hear them do Wishing Well. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. That's and then I added in, favorite. I want to see Sell It, which is a couple records back, oh, and I want to see Carried from the Start, which is for the previous record. It requires a bit more stuff than we were carrying this last round. but uh, Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. all right, so we've been talking a little bit about some of the stuff you do and some of the people you've worked with. How, when did you get started in, in music in general? I mean, what, was it something that you were always into? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it was a, you know, I started playing guitar in high school. Maybe a little bit earlier than that, so I was a guitar player for a bit and okay. uh, chasing that a little bit. You know, just a general vibe of I'm chasing music. I like music. Mm-hmm. Uh, my family was all blue collar work, various various tiers of that. Um, electrician. My grandpa was a fifty year electrician, and so on and so wow. forth. And mechanics and HVAC and stuff. So I had a lot of you know even some of the, even some family options there to go into. Right. Uh, as usual, when you're a kid, though, you want to just steer off the other direction from whatever right. family's doing, even if it's a good idea. And you're like, nope. And so I really was fascinated with music. And I played some bands. And I never went anywhere. It was all local. And then I really quickly realized a venue here in Portland where I grew up, you could get paid to load in shows. And at the time, it was like $50 total for load in and out. And you got half up front and half in the back. But you could come to the show, any show you wanted. And that was huge. It was yeah. called the Roseland Theater. Um, and it's you know just a proper... 1200 seat shithole kind of thing yeah but they i mean a lot of classic stuff has gone through that place and it was used to be called the starry night club in the 70s and 80s i mean it's oh, wow. got history and, uh <laughs> you know so it's been around forever i avoid it like the plague at this point uh oh, really? <laughs> these days but I, it's you know it's a staple and a lot of things and the black rebel plays there when they come through almost every time oh, wow. so anyway but i mean at that time like high school 17 18 years old wait a minute i can get paid 50 bucks and I can stay for the show. This is a dream. I mean, yeah. and then realizing, so that springboards you off into, well, if you like loading in or like this at all, you start learning there's a whole scene of this all over the place, load ins and outs and things and so on and so forth. And around the circle you go. And then quickly, I was very interested in sound out okay. of the options. And so I started various, there was a whole scene of clubs that had, you know, like a little tiny mixer, you know, you're doing little things. And then there was probably eight or nine clubs. Almost all of them don't exist anymore. I live in the crystal and a few others, and you could get the rotation of this. So you could actually do it. You could mix oh, wow. for almost no money. I mean, it was, you know, a hundred bucks a night, maybe, you yeah. know, to drink and maybe a meal if the place served, you know, one of them was called rock and roll pizza back then, or <laughs> pizza parlor. And you could eat and stuff. I mean, but I was whatever. I was on cloud nine at that point. I, I was just like, holy cow, you could sort of make a living doing sound and yeah. music this is amazing um and then that springboarded into like a house gig at a club and then into a small sound company and then actually an internship at the sound company i work for now which is a big long full circle in in 2004 and they're the biggest sound company in portland 
Portland's kind of a C market in the scheme of the world, but right. uh, we're the biggest thing here. It's a sizable company and okay. a lot of big festivals and venues and arena shows and stuff like that. And then the internship sprung off into various other things, other house gigs. And then I lived in LA for a little bit doing some stuff there. And I lived in Nashville for quite a while doing primary, just touring heavily out of Nashville. And oh, wow. companies there. And then I came full circle back to Portland because I got a chance to, I was on tour with the Dandy Warhols in Europe. I'd been touring with them quite a bit. They had a their previous manager was trying to, or two managements ago, that band cycles through managements. Um, <laughs> the uh, the guy was on this mode of like, I'm gonna, you guys are gonna go out, just hit it hard, and and uh, and make some traction in new markets, and it really it failed badly, and oh. the band lost a bunch of money. But <sighs> at the time, it was a lot of great work for Road Crew, right? So, yes. and you know, I wasn't I wasn't deep into the band at that point. I just got a call from a friend, can you cover a gig? And I stayed. And, so they were cranking it out and we did like three us tours that year and then we were in europe and then we were in australia and we were all over the place and while i was in europe the sound company owner was like hey do you want a gig and they kind of joke back and forth and text like well it's a bit of a commute from nashville yeah. you know that kind of thing because <laughs> uh, a friend of mine who had the job i had was quitting and moving on and stuff like that and, and then i pondered it for a minute and i was like yeah you know i'm kind of over nashville i'm kind of over the heat i'm kind of over the politics and why not i've been touring the dandy warhols anyway and they're from portland so i'll yeah. go there and he was fine if I kept doing some touring with them and so on and so forth. So that's how it brought me back to Portland wow. six or seven years ago now. I still do work with Danny Warhol's show in not as much. I kind of was their exclusive guy for a long time. Sound company getting bigger and the Black Rebel stuff and whatever has gotten in the way of some tours recently. But doing stuff with them for 10 years or so. Great. Another great band. Doing a symphony show with them coming up in March. So it's the Danny Warhol's with a full orchestra the oregon symphony oh, we planned this wow. for years it was supposed to happen may 20th of 2020 so you mentioned how well that went yeah so that got re postponed again and so on and everything changed but looking forward to it finally in march oh man and, that's, that's i think i remember peter because peter was on the podcast a, a while back in, in like the middle of covid and i kind of remember him mentioning that so, yeah, yeah totally yeah it was you know it's a huge deal we, they put out a bunch of money to have things scored 18 songs scored yeah to their music and a lot of revisions. I mean, it was a lot of back end work. I started the idea. It was kind of my brainchild because I oh. do, I do like three different things with the Oregon Symphony. So I freelance mix for them sometimes on various events, okay. just as an engineer. I cover working for the stagehands union for the house guy, who's also a really good friend of mine who mixes for them. So there's a couple overlaps there. Oh, and nice. then the sound company is the exclusive provider for all of their gear augments. So I'm just in this, <laughs> which hat am I wearing today <laughs> mode, right? With the symphony. Nice. And it's kind of our winter season. Like they, they take the whole summer off and that's fine. Cause that's festival season for the sound company and touring and so on. And then they do all through the winter. So we're there a lot in this hall that they're in oh, cool. and then we're also in that hall for various other promoted shows the arling schnitzer concert hall it's you know the place of like the 3000 seat you know ornate theater and stuff oh, like nice. that um two-tiered thing and it's the home of the oregon symphony and so okay. i've been doing these shows they call them pop shows where they would bring in some notable act and surround the symphony around them and do the show and they're sizable acts that have done this kind of scene oh, and they cool. do a couple of them a month and so i've been doing oh. those for the sound company for a while so i was like these are sometimes weird sometimes are really cool you know various degrees of it right and it just kind of made me start thinking i knew all the people involved and so i just said one day why why have we not done one for the danny warhols you know they're in this town you know that kind of thing yeah. and i was probably 18 2018 that i just you know said that out loud to the friend of mine and so we started talking about it and it eventually trickled into hopefully, but March finally will be the show. So wow! Yeah. Oh, we'll, man. we'll see how it goes. Well, yeah. quite a long time coming at this point. Knock then. on wood, crossing the fingers. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, question about working in the same venue a lot. Yeah, I know that for for me and for, as a photographer, if I go into the same venue a lot of times, it doesn't really. Matt, I have to do tests and I have to check things out because the lighting mm -hmm. for each band changes a lot. Is it the same for sound, even if you're working in the same venue? 
No, it, it, which is I like, uh, especially in a place like this. And we have these for all over the place, but um, you know, it's the same speakers. They go in the same spot, and we have the same software that you know designs all of that. Okay. And over the years, we've actually tweaked it. You know, like oh, let's do one little, let's do one little, let's do one little, let's do one little, and you know, kind of save that. So yeah. when we go in, it's really fast and fast res- perspectively, you know, um, right. to bring in full concert audio and whatnot. But um, it's very helpful to be in the same room over and over and over and over again. And with the same client, right? Because the right. band stuff changes out, but we know it's things that the symphony wants and we we know how they like things and we're constantly, you know, I just recently developed a sub, you know, sub speakers deployment that hangs actually above and behind the PA for, and it's designed to keep all the low end rejection where the symphony is. And so because I can go in that room all the time and kind of demo some of this stuff and test some of this stuff and go, look, I'm trying this for you guys, trying to make this better. Because that's always a problem. The symphony and the rock show is all the low end, the kick drum, and, you know, they drive some crazy. Oh, Um, really? And so trying to achieve options to get rid of that. Uh, and it's actually worked out really well because now it's a requested thing. Oh, can we have those that sub thing if the oh, budget nice. permits? And you know, because the shows vary in size. There's sometimes we send some stuff over there. It's just a few microphones and some wedges, and you know, not even any bodies. Wow. Uh, but like on Tuesday, we load in for a two day run with a local hip hop star called Amine, who's performing with, and he's not like he's big now. He blew up during COVID, I think on. TikTok or something, and it's going to sell out. I mean, it's a proper show, and there's a whole day of production rehearsals, and then a whole day with the symphony. So a big one. Oh wow! Three consoles and full PA and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, so so variant tiers of that. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, so is yeah. there is there a lot of variants? So all right, so you, when you're on tour, let's say you're touring with BRMC, and you've got a sound check each vent each venue and all is. Do you find that he, there's a lot of difference in the venues? Um, I know, because I know you do indoor sure. and outdoor, but is it is it yeah. a pain in the ass to, to go from one place to another and, and have completely different sound depending on the venue? You do. So, uh, I mean, the venue itself is not what you can do about that. You're never going to know until the first snare hit if there's like a crazy echo. Right. Oh. <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do about that? You know, that place in um, stage, what is it called? Stage AE or whatever it's called? That place. So that plays outside, outside proper, right? Or it's got two options, but we played outside and there's nothing behind us, right? So it's just more or less an outside thing. But yeah. When you play those sheds that have the metal roofs and stuff, oh God, those, those could be rough, you know, the concrete, you know, and stuff like that. And there's not much you can do about it. The, the speakers and stuff that we get rented, there's really an upper echelon of like five options. It really narrows down um, at okay. the touring pro A level that uh and it's expected that it'll be one of those five options and there's all sorts of emails that went in ahead of time to know i gotta i know what's coming i know the speakers i know how many they're going to be i know how they're placed i know, you know all these things they have okay. the cabling i mean they have these tech packets they send out from the venue when we first start advancing because i'm advancing in my role with black rebel i'm tour manager and the front of house engineer so there's two pieces there i'm doing okay and, I, and then in black rebel i absorb most of the production management details as well so i handle all of the production details and give them to our lighting guy, give them to our monitor guy, let the techs know. In our case, we carry most of the things that matter with us, the consoles. Uh, so my console was mine. I carried it with me the whole time. Oh, in fact, wow. it's, it's, it's this exact console. Oh, wow. It got damaged pretty heavily uh, and it ended up being an insurance write-off. And then I bought it off the insurance company just to throw in the studio. So it's, oh, nice. it's no longer going up the road. It works fine, but it's all beat up. And so you no longer need to go on the road anymore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So you kind of know that stuff's coming. You know, that it's this brand of speaker. It's this many of them. Okay, great. I've used that before. I know how it's going to respond. Okay. Uh, and you don't really black flag, you know, like, no, I won't use that unless it's weirdly. But you don't see that at the level they're at either. And nobody even offered anything that was dumb. So, okay. um, so you know that's coming. So really, it comes down to rooms, right? And we were inside quite a few times. And that stuff's also usually unique. You're like, oh, man. And there's nothing you can do about it. It's not like you can say, put up some acoustic stuff or right. <laughs> Or put the PA in some other place that doesn't work. You know, it's usually right. got an only place it can be. And so then you have to get down to a couple of things. Um, and I tr- travel with your own consoles huge because then, I mean, you can move files around. They're all pretty common. But, you yeah. know, what if they can't get the one I want? And then I'm using three or four different and you never really settle in. And then separately from that, I use a software called Smart um, from Rational Acoustics, which allows me to do system analyzing. So phase and delay times and various things with a microphone and that's just part of my day every day so once i get set up 
check all the lines are working to the PA. Great. And now let me hear it. And then, and then, and then, and it kind of makes some adjustments. Okay, great. And then I listen to it and go, yeah, that's close to what I want. So you're trying to get the, you're trying to get the palette. I kind of describe it as anyone that paints, you're trying to get it back to perfect white before you start painting on it. And you don't with various degrees of success. (laughs) Right. Um, and then you have to adjust accordingly. And then another thing I do every day, which is huge, is I do virtual playback, which is I've recorded every show in multi-track. So I have every input. And oh, it records wow. it in a spot that it can dump it back in as if the band is playing. Exactly same levels and same everything. Oh, wow. The only thing you lose is the stage volume. You don't have the stage volume. It doesn't bother me too much on an outside gig. In a club, that would be relevant. You know, the wedges and the you know that kind of stuff oh, are okay. a thing. But anything bigger... That's not relevant for me here in the PA. So it's great. So when I play it back, I can do, yeah, that's exactly what I want to sound like, or let me make some adjustments. Wow. It also allows me to spend a ton of time offline, like at home. I did a bunch of work before I even left for tour, working on mixes and things and getting through the catalog and seeing how I felt about songs and so on and so forth. So oh, it's phenomenal wow. for that. All things just trying to get it to be the same exact show when you're moving through that kind of scene. Okay. When you get bigger... Bands will carry. So a lot of those big, big acts, uh, less and less as fuel prices go up, as you can imagine. But um, you got to be pretty big at this point to be carrying your own PA, but you carry your own speakers. And that gets you even closer. So you, you make the company wow. take them down and you put yours up. And so it's at least some version of the same thing. And if you're doing arenas over and over again, you can get like exactly the same heights and dimensions and oh, you know wow. everything. So, and that gets you even closer. So that's but how Iron Maiden does it. Exactly. Iron Maiden definitely carries their own. Um, and they're out right now. Did you did you see the run they're on? I, I, a friend of mine went to go see him. He's in New Jersey. I, I haven't had a, didn't get the chance to go see him in this area, but he sent a couple of videos. It's insane. It's like a show from the 80s in, yeah. in the size and the scope of things. The props and the sound. Yeah, yeah, crazy props. Roger Waters is doing some crazy props still as well. You know, the wall falling down and the whole thing. He's doing 360 sound and all sorts <sighs> of crazy shit. I haven't yeah. seen anything like that since, I don't know, late 80s, early 90s. The it, crazy thing is most of those things, they still load in in a day, which is unreal. You know, like there was nothing in that room starting you know, at 5 a.m. in that arena. There was nothing. And somehow they managed to get, because the army of people, yeah. uh, you know, hundreds of people that are just, you know, moving around like ants uh. all over the thing. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Hey guys, I want to talk to you about socks for a second. Why not? It's a music podcast. But I tried a pair of socks from Boldfoot and loved them. I've only worn them once because my kids have stolen them. So in my household, that's the best endorsement I can give. And I guess it's fitting because the design I chose was Jailbait. Wait, Jailbird. The design I chose was Jailbird. I might keep that in. The socks are 100% American made and 5% of all proceeds go to veteran charities. It makes sense seeing that Boldfoot is a family and veteran owned company. They have a huge variety of styles. So check out boldfoot.com and buy some of the best socks you've ever slapped on your feet and help veterans while you're at it. That's boldfoot.com. And you got like a couple, I've been on a couple of those bigger tours where like your only job is seemingly some small piece of the equation. You know, like I was, I did some fly tech work on a Chesney one way back working for the sound company. Okay. And it was like my only job was one side of the PA. That was it. Oh, wow. You don't assist anyone else. <laughs> be here at this time because that's when the stuff will be ready because I didn't even push my own stuff. Go up. Wow. The stuff's coming up to me already from other people and get it up in the air and get it all stuffed and get your cable sorted and then get out of the way. It's somebody else's job the next step down the line. And because they got to move, it's stadium show. You know, you yeah. got minutes matter when you're behind and, and, and. So, uh, yeah. Wow. Big scale stuff like that. All right. So you mentioned working on the songs that the bands will want to play to get them to sound right before you go on. How does that work? I mean, do you have any input into uh, the, the song selection or, or saying, Hey, you know what? I mean, this is... other than I can just generally suggest when I'm standing back in the green room with them, because not to break any crazy thoughts people might have, but some of the stuff's made up pretty sh- just ahead of going on stage. kind of thing. So <laughs> I do appreciate that they will play. They don't like playing the same set over and over again yeah. because people follow the band around. They don't want to give them the same experience. They want to give them something unique. So exactly. that's pretty cool. But a lot of the staples are this, you know, like that whole tour they started with Devil's Tattoo. Just 
that that was solid. I knew that was coming every day. Yeah. There was various ones that changed throughout the set. I can't remember if that was one of the ones where we did where Micah actually played bass and Rob played something else. So I, I forget the song that was doing that on. Peter was doing "Alone" a few times, which I really liked that song. Oh, you love uh, it. Took song. it alone. Uh, there was something. There was a reason he stopped. Like it depended on where it was in the set, and the slide on that really throws that guitar out of tune. So if it's oh. needed for the next song. I mean, there's some complications there when you think about stuff like that. Wow. And then in the DC show, our guitar tech got hurt. He'd actually had an injury that got worse and worse. He had to go to the hospital, couldn't be at the thing. We had to fly another tech out. You know, it was for the press of the tour, kind of tripped yeah. us up a little bit. Yeah, Leah had mentioned uh, and, that to me at one point, yeah. And Peter's stuff is very complicated. Uh, and so it really came down to like, if we were either gonna work Peter to death <laughs> or we had to bring another tech out, and another tech can't just completely get up to speed on all these crazy tunings and pedal board programming and stuff like that. So yeah. we kind of did a hybrid where the other tech would like have his leg up and sit over there and could be the brain and do some tunings. And right. then the tech we brought out can run stuff back and forth and, you know, do the whole thing. Oh, wow. We definitely got through it and made new friends with the next, with a new tech who's been on some other shows with us. And oh, awesome. All good. He was a guy I'd worked with before. Everybody knows everybody in the scene. And so he was available. I'm so annoyed. I mean, I honestly, I loved Going to the Pittsburgh show, this, the venue was awesome. Everybody there was great. The show was amazing. I was able to walk around and, and take limitless photos. It was just perfect. But I'm, I'm, I'm so much happened on that DC show. I'm so mad that that was the one where. Um, oh man! I mean, that, the whole day I, I, I know the show was good. And I took a few pictures, but I was so, everyone was distracted because I mean, it was literally like maybe two hours before the show that he came up was like, Hey man, my legs really hurt. And I'm like, show me this wildly swelled up leg. And I brought the paramedics in and they were like, Holy shit. He needs to go to the hospital. And like, Oh man. Like, okay. And we sent our merch manager, my wife with him. Cause we're not just going to send him on his own. Right. Yeah. So then we're not, we're down someone doing merch. We're really all worried about him and we're down a guitar tech. And it's this big show, and yeah. I, you know, there's some texting about hospital costs and band card stuff during God. the show because I have to answer these questions. Yeah, but, you know, they got to play their show, and they're distracted. I mean, they said something about it, you know, over the mic as well. He's not with us, and hope he's doing okay. And, yeah, uh, and, then, and then that uh, that uh, one dude in the audience started uh, picking a fight with somebody else, and and Ian Asbury jumped out. That, so. That's hilarious because we didn't hear anything about that because we were all distracted with our own issue, right? Yeah, yeah. And we're on this venue, the the DC venue is so massive; it's got different floors. Yeah. And I purposely took a floor that is actually, as far as the venue was concerned, was like for opening acts, and they had nicer rooms for us next to the cult. And I was like, I'm good. Yeah. Like, let's have our own little <laughs> hole over here in the corner, isolation, right. right next to catering, and then we're the only ones there. Next to it was next to laundry and catering, and we had like three rooms right there. Oh, that's like, perfect. This is perfect. I that is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> So we were so distracted by our stuff. And then the second we were off stage getting our stuff packed and into the bus and figuring out what's going to happen with him, with Eric and like all that kind of, we didn't hear about any of that stuff that happened with Ian until a day later. Oh, and there was wow. like, art, like a friend of mine sent me the article. He's like, what were you guys doing in DC? Yeah. I was like, what do you mean? I, 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 I thought he was talking about like me, you know, and our, our trouble. Yeah. Uh, Cause that, that night culminated in like, they went to three hospitals because no one could see him. Oh I mean, God. it was like, really just a lovely example of healthcare in America. Um, yeah. And then eventually got to a hospital. We ended up sitting out in front of this hospital with a bus until like 4 a.m. Oh uh, and he finally had got through CAT scans because there was concerned, you know, like, what if he's got a blood clot? You know, I mean, it was right. all. And he eventually cut him loose to us. And then we headed up to New York. God. Yeah, we didn't know anything about any of that stuff. So we heard all about it later. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess Ian like either jumped in the crowd or something in some argument. I read the article, but I was yeah. like, man. I would have normally been nearby and maybe observed some of that. But right. Then we always, you know, stand outside of the stage and everybody's having a drink and waiting, you know, the crew has a drink. And then yeah. Leo was watching most of the sets, you know, on the other side of the stage, most yeah. of the tour and stuff. And none of us were doing any of that because we were dealing with this other thing. So, oh, yeah, man. they're all, yeah, I heard it was a whole thing. <laughs> Jeez, so we all missed it. I all heard about it. Yeah, afterwards. we all missed it. Damn. Yep. Yep. So, <laughs> well, hey, maybe, maybe a friend of mine asking me. Maybe next time y'all come yeah. to DC, we can get another fight going or something. There we go. We'll start something off. There yeah. We go. yeah. <laughs> so how did you get, how did you move into tour management in the first place? Who, who did you start working with and how did that happen? I mean, was that something that was intimidating? Cause I, I guess yes. what, yeah, yeah. what goes into tour management? What, what does a tour manager actually handle? So it's, it's various tiers of responsibility, you know, like, I mean, most bands, even in a van these days have somebody who's handling some kind of 
you know, administrative details, hotels or, or uh, flights or okay. van details. You know, somebody's got to do that. Yeah. And certain managements do it. And then you just have somebody gets the details on the road at the lower levels. And then it kind of rises up. And I resisted doing it for a long time. It didn't seem like anything I wanted to be a part of. <laughs> See, very counter to what I want to do. Uh, it's all waste of time until the 90 minutes or 60 minutes of mixing, right? So <laughs> right. I didn't want anything to do with it. And I, even to this day, a couple of friends of mine, uh, still, you know, touring buddies of mine, are just the sucker who put his TM in the front of his title. And, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, but I started doing a little bit of it because what the, the industry has become over the years is that role, tour manager slash front of house engineer has become a role that people need. And if you're only one or the other of that, sorry, we'll find somebody else. Wow. Um, and, and what you find is, and this is a little subjective, but what I have found is there's a lot of people that got in and they're very good at the admin side of things, accounting, because there's accounting involved and, you know, a certain men collecting money and so on and so forth. Um, okay. So you're doing all of that in flights and various things. And then you're doing an element of mixing sound. Now you find a lot of people that started with the, it's the admin thing is, you know, let's talk, a little say it's easier it's not but the different mindset and you can come up on a different side of the music business and do that and then maybe think you can dump in just add sound on and now you're tour manager for a house and that might work depending on how complex this, the audio stuff is okay. and so on but at the end of the day i think of audio as a craft and a you know lifelong pursuit and you right. know i really care about audio studio or live or otherwise and the tour manager thing but what really started happening with me was i was also simultaneously touring and being very irritated at tour managers. <laughs> so I had I had at least new things that I hated that tour managers didn't do well or did or didn't care about or didn't pay any attention to. So I, I mean, over the years, I'd always had that. And then there was an overlap. I started doing stuff with various bands where I wasn't fully doing all of it, but they were like, hey, is it cool if you collect a check? Can you, you know, kind of be more or less in charge and then somebody else will do all the flight details and some other stuff and give it to you. So I, I would call that kind of, uh, that was kind of old school road management. Okay. So you're not, you're not doing much of the beforehand stuff, but you're the guy in charge on the road. And then that was an easy step from there. Well, easy, but an easier step from there to be like, okay, well, I'm just going to start doing this next step. Now it's easier in the scene where there's a little bit of budget, for example, I got a couple friends who do this, but they don't have any budget or they're not allowed any budget to have like a travel agent. Okay. This travel agent takes a little bit of money, right? So if you're yeah. really skimping pennies on every last detail, then travel agent costs you a little bit. Yeah. I don't really dip down into that level because it's too irritating. So like, okay. it's not difficult for me to handle travel when all I have to do is ask Christy, here's the deal. Here's the date. She'll be some options. And I just answer some questions and she deals with it, sends it all to me. And if there's a problem, she'll do that. Okay. That's great. Fine. Yeah. That's how I deal with travel. I won't do any <laughs> stuff without a travel agent uh, because the problem with someone else dealing with your flights is, and just giving you the emails is you don't have any control over that. So Good you point. end up still with terrible flights and then a chain of people to sort out a problem, which is not good. Right. So right. if management's person who's day to day, who handed it off to someone who then booked flights for you for a tour. Oh God. If something goes wrong, we're screwed. Right. So, yeah. and something always goes uh, wrong. And some something point. always goes wrong. Yep. So yeah, I can't stress enough how great a good travel agent is for, I mean, like, of course, we're going to tour. So, like, I mean, I had people coming from all over the world. Rob was already in Austria. Yeah. So I'm coordinating him. I'm already on a run, and I'm in Spain. And then all the crew, and then one of the crew had to turn around right after show and go somewhere. Oh, jeez. And then we're pulling gear from L.A. and from Germany. And then, wow. the, and then the hotels and so on. So it's like, you know, it gets complex. Um, there's a software, an industry standard software called Master Tour made by Eventrix, I think is the name of the company. And it okay. is 100% just a, you, you put in your dates and an interactive thing. It's an app and stuff. So you get all the band on the app and oh, you know, they all know what's going on throughout the day. And you can kind of like put all of the details as you get them in there as you go. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Because at some point when you get tons of dates, like I'll have to reference a day myself like oh apparently i put all this info in here but i don't remember now <laughs> you know so it's a good thing i put it in here yeah you know, that kind of thing and, and you can adjust set times and set lists and all sorts of various things in it and guest passes and all kind of stuff oh, um awesome. and just gets sent it to the venue and it's got a database now it's some pretty much a standard so there's a database in there so i'm adding a venue it's almost almost 100 percent someone's been through there with master tour and it has some info and you're like oh yes this date it has the address it has all the you know, 
Great. Wow. Tech packets are in there. So that's worth it. And I pay for that every month to be a part of that thing. But well, it sounds like it's worth saves it. Your, it saves your life. Man. And then accounting. So you got to get, uh, and in the modern era, you're hardly doing any weird and weird. It's actually gotten easier as time has gone on to tour manage because it's all digital. It's all email. You know all the tech package. You know all the things. And the level that Black Rebel Tour is at, they've got enough budget to do some of these things to make it just smoother. And a travel agent handles frequent flyer accounts and preferred seats and all the little nuances and keeps it in a file. Cause that's what they do full time. So, you know, it's never, you know, like, cause people have eating restrictions or they're vegan or they're this or that, and they have to have this seat or they have to have that, or they've got their miles or they've got, you know, whatever. Yeah. So, you know, it's all very important. And then the accounting things varies from camp to camp. Certain people, you know, do it through management. Certain people do it through a business manager like Black Rebel, which right. is a really good way to do things. You have a business manager and then you have a music manager, separate entities. That and you know, everybody's an employee. You know, see, so the factors there. Like every time we hire a new crew, whether it's employee paperwork, like any other job, and, uh, and they got to be on insurance and workman's comp. And, you know, there's gear wow. insurance that goes out and it's all based on a percentage of how long you're going to be gone. So you have to do budgets, you know. So there's oh a bunch gosh. of admin stuff that's. Once you're rolling with the same with a band, it's actually the worst thing is getting up to speed with a new band because you don't know any of these people. You know, you don't know the nuances. You don't know anything about it. You don't know how they'd like to see things done or how this or that or how much they care about this or that detail. That Once you're sense. rolling, like I use the same template for budgets over and over again, and I use some of the same things over and over again because it doesn't change unless someone said otherwise. So that makes a lot of and sense. And then you hardly. You don't really collect cash anymore, hardly ever. Merch cash, there's a little bit of merch cash, yeah. but it doesn't add up to any substantial concerning amounts. Like back in the day when you were getting big guarantees, you're actually carrying more cash than you're supposed to be legally. And so that wow. was kind of a problem. Uh, and you'd end up <laughs> divided amongst the bands. Those old tour manager tricks was like, if you're crossing a border, you don't want to be carrying, you know, anything beyond $10,000. So you just like pass it off to all the band members so right. that they're all below that threshold. None of that's a thing anymore. It's all wired, right? So yeah. I, I didn't, I collected two checks total on that run. Oh, cashier's wow. checks. Every, everything <laughs> else was wired. And then I just, on the day off, I go down to FedEx and the band's got a FedEx account. Off they go to the business manager and Man. everything else is wired. And I had to check in on two wires that took, you know, longer than they were supposed to. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no problem. You know, and it's all big live nation contracts. So, not oh, really much to worry about. Yeah, and even like um, the thing, even merch. A lot of merch is done electronically now. You know, there's Venmo. Yeah, yep. and so there's a yeah, there's a couple of merch things. In Square, but Square's not outside the U.S. There's a company called At Venue, which is kind of the dominant merch thing, and you got all your inventory in there, and it's point of sale, and then all the money okay. goes in there and heads off to the merch company, and then there's deals done in the background that management deals with that I don't. I just got to make sure it got in. Yeah, uh, and there's a certain amount of cash that people are just going to give you every night oh, yeah, and yeah. that gets sorted out in the settlement, you know, but that's still an involvement, you know, so the merch manager handles that up to a point, And then I come up to settle because I'm handling all the money and I'll settle with a venue and there'll be some discussions at the end of the night. Like here's the amount of money you were owed. It depends on the type of deal. Sometimes we're just paid a flat amount. Okay. Well, then there's not much to discuss at all. Right. Great. Right. Or it's some flat amount versus a door thing. So if we did do really well, we're going to get a little bit more money and that becomes some math and, you know, making sure the amounts are correct. And yeah. there might've been something I needed that wasn't part of the arrangement, but the, the venue went ahead and handled it and they deduct it from the settlement. You right. know, it could have been some alcohol purchases or it could have been some gear we needed or it could have been, you know, anything. Yeah. Uh, and that wasn't part of the original arrangement. And so then it gets deducted. So it's a little bit of math to do there, but it's a lot easier than it used to be. And there's also percentage deals with merch. So the venues take various tiers of a cut. I have heard how insane that can be. How much? Yeah, how, and there's a there's a movement happening right now to not. And certain venues are on one side, and certain venues are on another. And certain venues that are on one side are taking nothing, and certain venues are still taking a pretty serious cut. Yeah, I do have personal opinions about it. I I don't know where it started. It's an industry standard that somehow because the venue gives you a hole in the wall by where they, you know, have the jackets yeah. that they're warrant warranted anything. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's one thing if you needed something from them, but you don't. And if you need someone to sell your merch, you're paying for that on top of these percentages. So yeah, exactly. You know, like, it doesn't necessarily, I don't know where this got. And then there's some big, there's been some pretty nasty fights recently because the, uh, you can take tips, of course, like any other point of sale, right? And the yeah. merch people get that. And we commonly get an extra person to help out. So you got plenty of people to do stuff and they share the tips. Yeah. There's been some camps who are at the end of the night telling the merch sellers they don't get to keep those tips and they take them. Oh I'm not quite sure how that's, I imagine 
depending on which state you're in, that's probably illegal. I think so. Um, Cause that's not tax money, you know, it's different, you know, it's considered, yeah, I, I don't imagine that's going to go very far. Someone's going to get sued somewhere. Oh, for it's sure. also just a terrible look. I mean, yeah, it, really? That's a, that is, <laughs> really? a, that is, that's horrible. I mean, why would it, if that gets back but, to well, it's uh, lots of money, I was like, if it's lots of money, then that means you made tons of money on merch. Like, I mean, these two go together. So yeah. and you're taking a huge you, chunk of merch. I mean, I, I, and from what I've heard from smaller bands, you know, the, the venues are taking like 35, 40%, which is yeah, we used ridiculous. To, you can push back a little bit and you're seeing it settle down and they're not quite as bad. Oh, and they're good. always different soft goods versus hard goods. And there's a different legality to try to take somebody's percentage of their music. So that commonly is different right. than the soft goods. And you can, you can play that game a little bit. If you, they won't let up a bit, then, well, then we won't bring that many soft goods and yeah. you know, that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, you're kind of screwing the fans out of getting stuff. So you kind of just want to get it to them. That's who you uh, yeah, get screwed uh, no matter what. <laughs> really. Right. Yeah, exactly. And there's a whole scene of like, you know, the headliner wanting you to price match your stuff with their astronomical prices. And yeah. Black Rebels aren't really into that. They want to keep it affordable. They actually care. I mean, they care all the way down to like Leah's in charge. Of, oh, I'm not wearing one today, but that, that all the cotton is fair trade. I mean, they, they care oh, wow. all the way down that's, um, oh. that the supply chain is good because not all T-shirts are. Oh, I and love so hearing that, that. You know, that costs them a little bit more, but it is totally worth peace of mind that you're doing something good and you know, it ends up being also a better quality shirt. And, yeah, I can so. I can vouch for that because I bought a shirt from every BRMC show I've been to, which I think equals at, at this point like four. So I'm, I'm, right, yeah. I see them as I can, and uh, I've I've still got every shirt there, and they're all in mm -hmm. perfect shape. I, I, one of my favorite things is to go there and pick up a different shirt. I've absolutely. We made up some crew only. Well, they're just a stolen piston. They just say crew. Oh, nice. Um, they're great. I was like, this is a really great shirt. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it yeah. was nice. So, who was the first band you actually ended up tour managing for? Oh, uh, let's see. And as a <laughs> official tour manager, not not that you're hybrid. Probably the yeah, probably the Danny Warhols. Um, oh, wow. And I even started not doing that there, and they were cycling through a lot of crew. And I was an anchor for a while. And then at some point it was getting really dumb. Like, cause I was doing, I actually started doing <laughs> monitors for them. And then at some point they were cycling through so many other people from inconsistent touring and personality conflicts and various other problems that I was like, you know what? I should just go to front of house. What I did before I met you guys and I'll just take care of this road stuff. And they were also, I mean, they also had a problem cycling through management as well. So everything is up in the air. Oh, um, gosh. And they went through a couple business management changes as well. I mean, so at some point, I need to collect this money, give it to one of you, and <laughs> do whatever you want with it. But it's getting weird, like all the people coming through. We can get up to speed all the other roles. Uh, and so I've done that for quite a while for them. Um, and then I've done some various – I've got one upstart band I'm doing some stuff for. We'll see how it kind of traction. They get their pop act, and uh, I'm doing some TM front of house stuff for them. Uh, oh, cool. They were like they were on America's Got Talent and did well on there and oh, wow. got some traction and uh, it's just classic pop, you know. And everybody okay. loves it. And there's a lot. There's a line around the block waiting for them when they arrive and wow. like and they're young and impressionable and lovely and moldable and hey. uh, so, <laughs> yeah, and they're great. And actually, it's you know really guilty pleasure pop music. I like it and they're awesome. really nice. So we'll see where that goes. But yeah, so I'm doing stuff for them. But mostly, I, I almost most of my career has been legacy acts anyway, in all regards. Oh, okay. Uh, and all my Nashville work was all legacy country acts and a few legacy Christian acts, which are real dominant in Nashville as well. Country Christians, big deal. In fact, that's why I went through Liberty University was a Christian act. Uh, okay, yeah. I was a sy systems tech, so I put the PA up, got everything ready, and I mixed a couple of sport acts, you know, Tours a tour. Oh and man, they paid well and nice guys. And you would have loved, you would have loved it yesterday because uh, the, the, the start off they lost power for half the Ooh. campus and which Ooh. included the stadium and uh, everything. So they had no Ouch. power. There's no concessions. They, they, nothing was working. So a lot of the bands are going on. And from even in high school at this point, there's a lot of electronic stuff that goes on. There's um, voiceovers oh, okay. that they do. And, and I mean, they, they had some backup generators where we could, they could get speakers working and all, but it was, you know, it, that's limited input and all. So there's really a whole yeah. big issue. That, and they finally got it sorted out, and they still had sound issues with the uh, the in house mics and, and and all. It was just oh, in the middle; yeah. it just cut out, so it was a mess. That's the worst. But 
Oh, see, so Danny's, I really started doing it full time. Yeah. And then in the sound company thing, I do all the other stuff, the, the venue bands that work on the other side of it. So all that was normal to me anyway. That was really no big deal. It was okay. the final piece of the accounting. Um, I, I resisted with the dandies because they're actually pretty pretty frugal with their money. So they didn't like having a travel agent. They didn't like having other things. And I really wasn't willing to do some of that stuff in other countries if I couldn't have a budget for people to handle some of those details. That makes sense. I was not going to be the guy that missed a form that I didn't know I needed, and now we're stuck at a crossing or some, you know, something. Uh, is like, no, if I can't hire someone, then find somebody to do this job. So yeah. uh, I would do the U.S. stuff because you know, I, I toured extensively in the U.S., so it's fine. And then various details. So that when Jordan asked, Jordan's the manager at Revelation for Black Rebel, and he's also the manager for the Dandies. I got him in there oh, okay, when during cool. covid so when their other management was ending i was like i know this guy jordan you should really talk to him and it worked out that way so oh, he had worked with me before and he uh the the guy that used to do all the black rebel stuff was retiring he had a kid who get off the road no hard feelings loved him but yeah. had to get off the road so jordan asked me if me and um tiki would come out we were interested and i was like if we're interested yes yeah. <laughs> Luckily, it was an email so i didn't have to play it cool right. uh, i was like holy <laughs> shit black rebel has immediately showed wife and i was like man Yes, yes, you know, and play it cool for a day, and then respond, hey, yeah, thanks, Jordan. Yeah, let me think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretend like I wasn't going to do it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Uh, and so then, great, when we travel internationally, I have the same booking agent. I have, you know, people helping. And then there's another element you don't ever hear about is the booking agent. So they're the ones that handle someone wants you or they're actively trying to find you shows right and they're a separate entity entirely and then they negotiate per already discussions that they've had with the band at going rates and there's a magazine called polestar i'm sure you're familiar with it tracks attendance and how well you did or didn't sell out and stuff yeah. like that which becomes a, a factor in how much money you can get you know how much did you sell out of venue wow. before for x amount of money and you consistently do it, then great. That means you can now start demanding more. Or unfortunately, if that number is decreasing, then also promoters in local towns are going to go, no, you didn't sell out here last time. Right. But booking agents handle all of that. Okay. And then I get handed as tour manager, here's this show, here's the amount of money we're getting paid, here's the arrangements, any weird notes that we've agreed to or not agreed to, <laughs> and various details. And, you know, some of that stuff comes up because okay. they already had our writer and they had all those details. And, and there's some sometimes some miscommunication, but not bad. It's gotten a lot better. Oh, that's um, cool. And so there's a whole other person there. And they also will handle, especially when you go out of country, they'll help you handle like, okay, you do need this visa. You do need this. Fill out this form get the band to fill out this form. And I keep a bunch of records of the band. I've got all of their passports. I've got all their, you know, some various details from me because I needed all that for the flight people. Oh yeah. Um, and then when we're leaving the country, I need all that stuff and a certain amount of it, they even have to do themselves, you know, especially like during COVID to go to Australia was just oh. insane. Uh, yeah. And wild stuff had to be filled out and really? that kind of thing. So yeah. And Man. then like, not even a guarantee. It was like, and we'll let you know. Uh, I was like, Oh, Okay. Wow. And they were restricting touring crew. It was a, can anyone in Australia do this job? Because if so, you're not bringing your own people. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Good girl. and there's various other countries that are out restrictions and things will come up. And that's a, another reason why if I can't have, a, have somebody helping me figure that out, it's too much to do that and also have to be doing something. Oh. It already becomes an interesting thing. Show day. Show day is an interesting thing for a tour manager in front of a house. Yeah. Because there's like the roadie job and then there's the admin job, which happens all day long. It's the dressing room stuff ready. Where are we supposed to be? Where's the band? Where, you know, you're kind of just keeping track of everybody. It's yeah. just, I've always joked that like, I'm always standing. And if I put my phone away for any length of time, within a few minutes, I'm going to either look again or there's already something yes. to be dealing with. And it's not all bad. <laughs> and you can get into flow. And I do like tour manager front of house position at the level that black rebel is at because when you start getting up to those major tours when you're talking about 20 trucks and 100 people that's a whole other separate nightmare right? oh Just i can only imagine yeah so that's not something i have friends that are in that level and i i'm not necessarily interested in that level you would need an assistant and various other things and i don't think you could continue being also be in a roadie which is what i want to be so yeah you know i this level is great but yeah, the day of stuff gets it, interesting. So like, I mean, luckily you're on a similar schedule, right? When I'm needing to mix, they also need to be on stage. So that's convenient. That's a good point. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> and then we work out. There's labor local everywhere we go. They're called just stage hands or hands to yeah. help us bring all the, the gear in. So we're not wearing out our guys either. Okay. So then our guys are just setting up our stuff on risers and kind of pinning. And the other audio guy that's doing monitors usually handles most of the audio stuff. And then I get my own console out to front of the house and just get my stuff ready. And then wait for a little while and then do my thing and then go back in the back and, you know, what okay. do you need? You going back to the hotel or not? You know, this is what we're doing next. And, you know, and then it's all the little details, which I actually like because it's the little details, especially when you're out on the road for a long extended period of time that make all the difference mentally. Like, uh, I need this. I need the, you know, and that's the stuff that I found that tour managers didn't care about. You know, they uh. kind of just, just missed it that, you know, you don't need all that kind of stuff. Or whatever. Like, well, need is a relative term, but like it's still helpful it's comforting you know and you find out yeah. i prefer to find out from every you know like three of the crew made black rebel smoke and so does pete i think or, i mean it, he does smoke but anyway it comes down to everyone likes to do brown cigarettes all right well that's a small but somewhat important thing for people who smoke yeah that it's not just a random brand of cigarettes right or that they don't have to try see the other thing i don't like to do is i don't like to try to make the band have to go get anything because they need to stay focused on resting and getting in the mind space to play that's if they point. have to think about things like i have to go find cigarettes because tour manager doesn't do it yeah. well is it technically in my job no but it's much in my best interest to acquire those and just have them available and various details right so that kind of stuff always made a difference to me as a crew member various things i want whether it's alcohol or it's food you know preference of food and when you do and don't want it and realizing what you like after a show and and everybody's got different opinions and it's fine great yeah most of that can be accommodated right it's not that big a deal and you're not the, talking about wild prima donnas that have to have this or that i mean right. that exists and that's also fine if they can deal with that and budget exists for it but yeah if you can keep the band and, and the crew happy that makes everything mm -hmm. so much better and you get into a flow or a kind of a tour swagger that you like everything moves well everything kind of goes well and when you get up and it's already hard enough to be on a road yeah. You're not sleeping in your own bed. There might be a sleep, but there's temperature problems and various other things. And when people do and don't like to be up and various you know, noises and things, and then it's stressful and you're not at home, you know, and various other things, right? So yeah. if you can remove as many of those as possible, those little ones, it ends up being so much better. And I like doing that. And it makes a difference to me. It always made a difference to me. So then, and I, since I, from, and I've joked before, there's tour managers who do sound on the side, and then there's sound people that do tour management on the side. I'm definitely the latter. Uh, and, you know, you work on that skill set and so on. So I'm, you know, I'm a crew guy first and then on and up and on the line. And it just makes it, you know, even flight stuff, like I, nobody pays any attention to, or not nobody, but uh, I always found nobody paid any attention to the fact, like, well, yeah, but I have a connector that's like 20 minutes later after I land. That's, I got to like hustle. I got to run. I got to like, you know, yeah, I hate that. You know, that yeah. kind of thing. Also I'm a rarity that I would prefer a layover of some kind than a direct flight of a super long. Oh. Most people are not that way. Most people just want to get it over with. Yeah. Um, you know, one long ass flight. I'm, I don't know. I'm six foot one, you know, <laughs> two sixty five on a good day. Like I just assume get off the plane for a little bit of time, use a real bathroom, Stretch have a your snack. legs stretch a leg, walk around a little bit, you know, and then Makes get sense. on the next flight and go. Right. But I'm sense, rare yeah. that I, most people don't want that. They just want to get it over with, you know, uh, yeah. pop whatever the doctor gave them for anxiety <laughs> pills and, and go. Right. <laughs> and, and that's also fine. If that's what makes it, you get through stupid amounts of time in the air, then that's what you'll get. Yeah. You know, so I'll pay attention to that. I'll do my own flights because everybody comes from everywhere, somewhere else anyway. So it doesn't really matter. Right. Um, and so, okay, great. You guys want to go direct. Great. You want, you know, I'll have you stop here and here and I can do my own however I want. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and stop wherever. Yeah. As long uh, as everybody gets there at the, at, at the right time. Yeah. Various seat things and various other things, you know, like there was a massive layover, like of eight hours on the way to Portugal for Pete and Leah. So it was like LA straight to Munich or something like that. Right. And luckily they've been flying for so long. They've all got status, which yeah. means they can go to a, a lounge, a nice one. And so I'm double checked, got it scheduled, even the little details like that, making sure she had her card for it and everything. So then literally like they get off their plane and the lounge is right there. Oh, nice. And great. And then they're there for seven hours. They can also have a guest. So one of the other crew that was coming through there also into the lounge. Great. Got that sorted kind of out the door. All those little things that make a difference. Uh, it makes so much sense now why they, why, why Pete, uh, why Lee was telling me, tell Chris, hi, and we love him, and uh, yeah, so it's They're making great. a lot of sense. Yeah, we've been fat. It's like uh, you know, I haven't been around that long, but we definitely clicked in a way that's rare. 
uh, all of us did. It was like we've known each other forever, and that's not always the case. Not 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 uh, romanticizing touring. I've mean, had plenty <laughs> of tours where it was just a job, well, and, but this was all. It was like wow, we've known. It's like we've known each other forever. Like so, this has always been this way, which is really nice. So speaking of that, uh, one of the questions that you, I, I'm sure you know you're you're gonna get is. So you've been you've been a tour manager for a little while. And I know you had to put out fires. What is like the, one of the worst fires that you've had to, to to put out as a tour manager? And you know, feel free to uh, to, to change the names, leave out names to, for the yeah, innocent, change the names to protect the innocent. Yeah, in, innocent's a bit loose for a rock star. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, I haven't had I, I definitely have just some horror stories, right? And you know, drug induced or violence or whatever. I haven't yeah. had to run into too much of that either heard about it because we all know each other right, right. Um, so yeah i'm sure it's a sw- uh, small community of you guys yeah exactly uh it's there's a somewhat comical one is that that pop act i started doing some stuff with the previous guy had you know a little bit of a it, and not making light of having a breakdown it, mental health in this industry is uh, no joke but he had oh, a bit yeah. of a breakdown at a show uh really? and they he was already having a rough time, and at the end of the show, which he had a really bad show, and they were kind of frustrated, a long-standing problem and whatnot, they kind of decided at the end of the show, we're going to let you go. Wow. Also, A, band probably probably should have done that when they weren't in the same room together and had to travel home together. <laughs> uh, but, you know, l- live and learn, uh, yeah. because this next step, because he just kind of snapped, locked himself in the green room, started trashing the place, screaming, how can you do this to me? Security had to come. They had to leave without him. They don't know how he got home. Like, oh. it was bad. And then the funny part was I'd heard that. It's not funny. I mean, it's it's comical in this context, right? But, you know, yeah. it, it sucks for the guy. Obviously, that's he was having a really terrible, awful low point in his life. Yeah. He was really young, right? I, I did make the joke, like, it's much easier after you get fired from the couple bands. You know, it doesn't matter after that. Yeah. Uh, but if that was your first one, then it definitely hurts worse. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So there's that kind of stuff that definitely goes on. There'll be crew confrontations because uh, everybody's just got this big, I'm in charge of everything. And various tiers you know it's always kind of assumed whoever's the name whoever's the toppest thing they're somehow bigger better gods than you are yeah uh at the, at the end of the day it's like well we're all on this bill for some reason higher than us right so yeah. there's some of that kind of stuff and then hopefully you don't have any personality issues internally because that can be a real pain and then you know some of the substance abuse stuff becomes substance abuse for a loose term but like you were in a festival in the uk with a different band and we played our set. It's great. Cool festival, really cool people. And at the end of the night, we're not leaving till four in the morning. That's our bus call. Wow. Okay, fine. And so is the other band that was headlining, a prominent rock band as well. I'll just you know protect the innocent. Right. And the venue promoter was like, hey, by the way, we're all going to this festival still going on. Just the main stage has ended. It's like this carnival vibes everywhere. You know, okay. just this crazy festival. It happens all night. Wow. The main stage has ended. And we're backstage with our buses and catering worlds and stuff like that. Well, they're like, hey, we're taking off. Um you know, the staff is, but we're going to leave the catering slash bar and green rooms open for you guys until you guys leave at 4 a.m. Have, you know, have a good night. I was like, wow, unattended. You're just going to leave these two rock bands <laughs> and their road crew just <laughs> free range to the bar God. and catering. And like, oh, God, like I, as a tour manager, I'm like, no, don't leave. Yeah. No, please don't leave. Because now I'm just going to be. The... And so that turned into, you know, a bunch of drinking and, you know, everybody's having a good time and laughing and noise. And that. But then at some point. Well, let's go out and explore the festival statement come up oh. with people that are already been, you know, pretty three sheets to the wind. Right. And, you know, and the theory, the idea was here, I'm leaving my phone and everything here so I don't lose it. Also means I can't find you when come bus call. Exactly. And, and now we're all like, do we go search this festival of 20,000 people or oh. is that just useless? Right. Ended up finding this one at having a great time <laughs> in a silent disco way off the other end of the festival and like i thought we were leaving at four like it is it's four thirty, so you know that kind of thing uh and some of the like okay well i got up i was the first one into the venue at 7 a.m and now it's 4 a.m because i have to be until everybody's on the bus and we and you can't trust that they're going to stay on the bus at two so (laughs) until we drive away until i know i have them stuck in the container in the in the (laughs) you know the submarine on wheels right i can't really go to bed Oh, and then there's some rules. You know, people have been oil spotted before. The of like, you get off at a truck stop. 
to go to the bathroom. The bus driver didn't know, and then he drives off because they're not going to check the bunk and make sure everybody's you know everybody's bunks are closed. So yeah, if you don't make sure to tell the driver, and there's various ways that people uh, leave your passes in the front seat so that he knows okay someone's inside. And various uh, things like that have come up. You know, you've left someone and then they don't have their cell phone. It was in the butt the bunk. You know, I, I had so a... they're at a truck stop trying to figure out how to call anyone, and yeah. who knows anyone's numbers anymore. A bassist yeah. had that had that problem, but he they didn't he didn't have an international thing on his on a, his phone an international plan and he was on tour and the bus took off and they were in, he got stranded in poland and they took off without him and he's sitting there with no self no cell service he had to sit there and wait until they realized he wasn't on the bus and had to oh, come back around yeah, totally so he's just sitting at yep, some rest yeah. area in poland yep those things have definitely happened uh i mean i don't run too much into the and they're not, you know, there's been some issues over the years and various positions I've been, but not as a tour manager where, you know, the substance abuse is a real problem. Yeah. That stuff still exists, of course, but that exists in any world. It just seems to be. It's funny part is substance abuse exists almost on the same rate in any job as it would in the music business, but yeah. you assume it's happening in the music business. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because the roadies have become less and less you know, using of substance because our stuff is so res- like you can't be flying PA and doing rigging and stuff while you're drunk. That's just not tolerable. I mean, that right. just it the the production side became very responsible, up early, no dr- no drugs, no nothing, eat healthy, just not the old, not the cliche. I mean, whatever people still drink and do whatever they want, yeah, various things. But um, and border crossings can be tense e- even when nothing's going on. But any border patrol agent, you tell them you're in a rock band. They immediately have some, you know, stigma, right? Yep. So, they get or you're the dogs out. It doesn't matter. Yeah, they get the dogs out or whatever. Uh, <laughs> and you know, and the funny thing is, like, I've had some issues where uh, touring with bands that are from states with legal marijuana, and they don't have any marijuana in their bag, but yeah. they have before, and a dog spots it in another country. And so then you go through this uh, whole process, and you have to kind of. It's better to be upfront about it. Like, we're from somewhere where this is okay. Yeah. We're not carrying anything. We understand you need to search stuff. And we're all cool. You know, don't don't be cagey about it, right. uh, and definitely don't be mad about it. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so it's always better yeah, to be upfront about that. You know, language barrier stuff becomes interesting, and oh, realizing, man. yeah, that's an interesting one. I had a guy in Spain, uh, in Valencia, for some reason, just decide. I didn't think he just didn't like me. Uh, and so he wanted to go through my whole bag on the way out and, you know, claim to not speak in English. I was in a bad mood. So I, <laughs> I said something nasty, uh, in English and he, you know, perked up and I was like, you seem to understand that. And you yeah. know, like people are with me like, shut up. I'm like, oh, yeah, fair enough. I'm not, yeah, I'm out of my own country and I'm being an asshole. I mean, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. I've had more issues though. The funny part, I had more issues returning to the U S my own country than anywhere else really with border stuff. And really? I, I'm less tolerant when it's the people I'm, my taxes are paying for. And like, I'm also, what yeah. are you going to do? I'm coming home. Like, right. <laughs> one way, one way or the other, I'm going to get let in here. So get, go yeah. back, come back when you feel, when, when yeah, you yeah. learned your lesson. Which yeah, it's one yeah exactly. So, <laughs> no, I haven't had too many horror stories. Knock on wood. Um, That's good. Other than just you know various things, uh, you run into a shady promoter here or there. Um, there was a show canceled, even on that last run. You know, and I don't know all the details and how much I should really talk about it, but it got weird and it, I think it came down to some like they didn't really have the money and you know uh, that kind of thing. Oh wow. Uh, yeah, it got a little weird, and that's come up before. And there's some signs for that, and then I kind of pressed it a little bit and then yeah. kind of actually insisted we were going to get paid paid cash. That was the end of it. Cause they didn't have it right. They could have faked a wire or said we're sending it soon or, you know, that right. stuff. it's still a little bit of, it, you know, at the end of the day, I don't trust anyone. I'm working for the band, right? I, at the end of the day, exactly. I'm working for the brand I'm wearing that day kind of thing and no one else. I don't actually care. And there's a few times it came up with the crew from the cult, you know, good guys like them all, but it was kind of a like, well, you know, we need this. And I was like, great. I, I don't work for the cult. I yeah. Only care. I only, it's like, you seem to only have one, one statement was like, you only seem to care about your band. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the guys who are paying me. Yeah. Yeah. The guys are paying me the ones I care about. And like, you know, don't get me wrong. He was a nice guy, you know, Rob and him are friends and yeah. so on and so forth, but I'm not working for him. I'm working for them. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. So, so uh, what is the longest stretch you've been on tour for with, with a single on a single tour? Uh, one week shy of three months. Wow. What it is. Seven. Yeah. Yep. Oh man. Uh, That's gonna be tough. So that was a long one. That was a long one. Yeah. It was like a U.S. tour that jumped right into 
there was a couple days off, but I didn't go home. So it, it was really just a U.S. tour, jumped straight to a European tour and slugged it out and wow. then stayed and jumped down to a one-off in Spain, big festival, and then home kind of thing. And yeah, there's some re-entry problems with that. I call it re-entry and various <laughs> other people have different issues. But when you stay out for a long time, the as I call it, re-entry to real life is, is an adjustment. It's a mental thing. I mean, you get really used really? to all those little details being handled. You get adjusted to your micro life you know it's only this luggage that you care about and it's this and you from different cities and adrenaline and you like in the shows and you know yeah you, on tour you don't really think about anything you get per diem every day and you get paid as you're going and then meals and everything are provided so like unless you're out just shopping and spending all your money you don't have to try to search out food you don't have to try to search wow. out lodging you oh. don't have to try to search out anything really right i mean because yeah. that's the idea you're just doing the job everything else is handled for you that's so wild. when you come home, you find, you know, like I've had this before, like, you know, why is my phone not working? Oh, shit, because I've been on tour and I haven't paid the bill and, like, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And, uh, you come home and you haven't dealt with real life, you know, all this stuff that's not glamorous because right. you've been out and it's easy to forget about it. And not for everybody. Certain people don't like being on tour. I actually really enjoy touring. And in the right scenarios, I could do it, you know, pretty consistently, especially bus touring. And because you can really get comfortable on a bus because your stuff kind of lives there, you know, and you got your own little world. And depending on the act, you know, these guys don't party much. So that's nice. Right. You know, and there's not a pile of people on the bus or anything. So <laughs> um, there's been various other acts that I've had that issues with that stuff. But um, yeah, so reentry is a, is a brutal one because then, then you're home and then. And then, yeah, I mean, I almost always need a schedule and I don't get away with it. Sometimes I have to go straight from home and then the next day straight to a sound company gig, slump on the gear and off. And, and the mental shifts can be really difficult because the day before that, I was in charge of everything and everybody's bringing my stuff in for me. Yeah. And then now all of a sudden I'm home and, oh, right, I can't really afford to eat at fancy restaurants every night when I'm not on tour. <laughs> right. you know? and, yeah. Oh, this doesn't really... So work, right? It sounds like a like a weird version of PTSD almost. It is a little bit. Um, I, I don't want to equate it to you know the, the horror of PTSD for me. Right. Um, it was like a but shock. I have a, some kind of shock. from a. Um, I have some P diagnosed PTSD from an injury on a show where a piece of steel hit me in the head during a loadout. Whoa! Uh, and it, it freaks me out. You know, if I hear the same sound again and whatnot. So, and then therapists have identified it as PTSD, a version of it for me. So. Yeah. It is a similar gut feeling. The re-entry thing is weird. It's got like a the depression thing. And guys fall into really heavy, you have people in general on the touring scene fall into some real heavy depression when they come home sometimes. And that's been a concern wow. for people. And I've had some friends fall into that because it can be this crazy lie. And then if you've got family, it's a whole other angle as well because you weren't there. So now you're catching up. And, you know, some of these guys have a hard time. They have kids and a wife and the whole scene. And you're out in this other wild rock scene or whatever you're in yeah. on this life. And then you come home and everything just immediate because there's nothing's changed for them either. They've just been missing you. And yeah. then their life has been going. So it didn't stop, although it stopped for you and so on. And it's not something that like tapers ahead. down, you know, you're, you're no. that one day. And then the next day, it's, you're a completely different world. It's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's some, uh, especially when you're leaving family. I get, I'm lucky enough that uh, Tiki also does merch for the Danny Warhol. So. I don't at this point tour without her. So I don't have to think about the, oh, the, awesome. the lead up to uh, when you're about to leave uh, a family member back on another long tour, that gut wrenching, I'm going to be gone for a chunk of time yeah. is also brutal. And then when you're out, it's hard to communicate, especially in another country, right? You know, if you're in Australia, you're 16 hours off. So how do you just find time to, and they want to chat when it's a bad time and you got to stay up late, but you need to sleep and you know, that kind yeah. of thing. And, Oh. It can be really brutal. Yeah. I mean, some of it, that, that's the non-glamorous side of rock and roll. It's yeah. standing behind your bus in the rain, smoking a cigarette, smelling <laughs> diesel. And you're like, huh, <laughs> this is the in a truck stop in the middle of nowhere. Right. And you're like, oh, this real glamorous. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A friend of mine here locally has a joke about he wants to make a scent candle that's the scent of roadie. And it'll just <laughs> smell like cigarettes and sadness. <laughs> and I was like, wow. It's funny. Yet, ouch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but have you, how many, oh God, how do I, how do I ask this? Because I don't want this to sound stupid. <laughs> but do you tour manage uh, bands that 
would surprise me if you like uh, I know you just mentioned that like a, a pop band that, that you're working with that's kind of like a guilty pleasure have you had other of those because I'm familiar with you through obviously BRMC Dandy Warhols yep. you know these these heavier rock alternative type of bands but is, is there other bands that you work with that uh, even if so it's not your tour manager. You, yeah, like yeah, a genre yeah. you're into uh, or not I didn't do any tour management, but like I've gone across the board. Like I was with Macklemore, uh, it's front of house. I wasn't tour managing, but I was like production in front of house of them. Like oh, wow. it was popping off in 2011. Yeah. Like we were moving from, we were weirdly still in a sprinter and that was a massive mistake on that tour <laughs> management part. Um, but like every venue was upgrading and, uh, you know, it was just this wild time and these lines are on the block and like, wow. it was a crazy time to be with them. Um, but awesome. it was brutal. It was like 50 shows in, in 55 days or something stupid like that like it is sprinter right so it was just the most brutal touring i can even remember even to this day and i've done some you know three months legs right. that were nothing like that because oh. it was like you know even if you what those five days off weren't off days by any means it was you know drive to another gig and have an evening in a hotel if you're lucky yeah, and yeah. hotels are rare because we were pretty much just driving all the time and like sleeping upright in the van and oh. i mean it was still wildly exciting and awful and it should have been a tour bus, but they yes. had no idea. Like they didn't know they were popping off that big. Like they kind of knew that they were doing okay, but they didn't realize how that was the that was the year where it just went boom, and wow. you could not hear him. And then I actually I uh, I keep the email just for reference, but I uh, I mouthed myself off right out of that gig. That's oh. one of my. Uh, and so when I talk to <laughs> friends of mine, or I have you know I do a little bit of teaching and I mentor some young techs and whatnot. Oh, cool. uh, every once in a while, one of them will not get a gig or they get fired or whatever. And I remind them like, look, I mean, it happens, right? It is personalities or it's this or that, or maybe you did nothing wrong, or maybe you did something wrong in the case of like, I let that manager know how I felt about that tour. And he said, great, well, we'll find somebody else. Oh, oh and, uh, yeah. The, yeah. I mean, so was I right or wrong? I mean, if it wasn't good for me, then it was probably good that I went somewhere else. Right. right. So as I got older, I, you know, I better ways to handle that. I could have just said, no, thanks, you know, and moved on yeah. I, at this point, the long paragraphs of what you should do better almost never translate to, they're <laughs> going to just turn around and go, Oh, you're right. You know, why didn't we do that? Like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Oh, uh, that was a great time to be with them. You know, no hard feelings. And for right. years after that, until they got even bigger, where they all had to change their phone numbers, I still, you know, that's just that. They messaged me and, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah. you know, all good. And then I did a lot of country work in Nashville. So I worked with a lot of uh, 90s country acts, and then I'm still close oh, with. Cool. Uh, I worked with uh, Aaron Tippins and Sammy Kershaw. Wow. And friends of mine are still in those crews. And uh, a couple of years ago, Sammy came out here, and his longtime front of house production manager guy, uh, tour manager, was actually sick with cancer. So oh, he couldn't make a gig. Wow. Uh, and then he just actually recently died last year, unfortunately. It was oh, really I'm bad, so sorry. Greg. But when he came out here to play a festival, the sound company I worked for was doing, uh, when it figured out I was going to be here, I just went ahead and mixed the show anyway. So, oh, nice. and got to hang out with them and see them. And I did a lot of touring with them. And they do a thing in Nashville, which is actually the really great. It's called Weekend Warrior Work uh, or various terms. But like the Nashville touring scene, they tour all year. And they go out on the weekends or sometimes extended weekends. So it might be a Thursday night for a Friday show, a Saturday show, and a Sunday show, and then you're home Monday morning. And they go back and forth in and out of all over the place to Nashville. And on occasion, because that place is pretty much other than west of the Rockies, in less than 12 hours, you can be anywhere from Nashville. And so, and then on occasion, those acts, which, you know, that kind of country scene doesn't have as much draw on the West Coast, but they do some. Uh, what they'll do is they'll come out for a two-week or longer run and go up and down the West Coast and then go home and then go back to their usual touring schedule. Okay. What it means is if you're a road crew for them, you've got a full-time gig. You don't have to be thinking about when the tour ends and I got to find another band and hopefully none of that stuff at all. Oh, okay. uh, and you're also home every week. So it's just a gig where you leave Thursday night, drive to the artist's house and leave your car there and get on a tour bus, uh, <laughs> usually that they own. And this is always the scene, they're not always, but common in the, in the legacy act of country scenes, they own the buses, yeah. which is the only scene I've ever seen this. Most people lease them. And so you don't have to move out. You keep stuff in your bunk while you work there. I mean, it's like, it's a, you know, wow. full-time job. Uh, it's a bit of an adjustment, but at the same time, you're like, oh, wow, the, the stress of not having to think about, see, when I worked as just a freelance engineer, halfway through a tour, I'm already thinking about what my next one is. Because I have sense. to keep going, you know, because the second that last show ends, I'm unemployed. Right. You know, like, and so you're constantly having that concern and worry. And if you don't have something lined up, how long is this tour going to carry you until you find something? You know, it's just yeah. always happening, right? Uh, not in this case. So weekend warrior work was awesome. So you're like, you know, almost all, right, almost immediately they're going to give you at the beginning of the year, 
most of the year's dates. Yeah. They're going to add some. So you know how much you're making, how much you're going to make that year. You know you're going to be on and off these things. You know we're not going to work this holiday, but we are going to do a Christmas show this year. And kind of know all that right up front. Right. And then that's just the gig. And great. And so then you're, you know, you're gone Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You're home Monday before anyone even gets up. You're home most of the week. And then you do it again. It's just wow. all around a circle. Some variation on that theme. Um, that's pretty awesome. And, and that's great. And it's actually better for the, you know, there's the reentry things nowhere near as bad because you're not gone that long. Right. And then you're home to be doing stuff every week. And then the money thing is you could rely on it. You're like, oh, this is what I do now. Yeah. And if you wanted to, you could do some other stuff earlier in the week. You know, a lot of guys did that. I did a little bit of that stuff, you know, some freelance work and fill in, you know, okay. and then back out with your band and whatnot. So the Nashville scene does that really well. All the gear leaves from there and so on, and, you know. Wow. So, oh, that's awesome. And actually. they got just a, kind of a tour circuit they just do, you know, over <laughs> and over again. You play a lot of the same places. Yeah. You know, same thing. They loved you. They come back. You come back every year. It's a big deal. And great some of them are you know terrible little honky tonks and some of them are <laughs> sizable gigs and then you know in the summertime you're hitting the festival circuits and you're playing a lot of big festivals and yeah but you could play like a uh, when i went with another act called tracy lawrence a bunch of number one hits in the 90s i remember um, yeah yeah so then i did two and a half years of him in front of house and he wow. played like the opening weekend we headlined a festival for forty thousand people and then we played a county fair for ten thousand people because People come out in droves to see Tracy Lawrence in the middle of nowhere. And then we played a shitty honky tonk for a thousand people. And that was a pretty, in three days, right? So that was a really good sampler, though, of how his kind of touring circuit worked. And that honky tonk still paid him the same amount of money as all those other three because they're getting people packed in there yeah. and drinking and so on and so forth. So, I mean, money's money. He doesn't care. Set up in the corner and do some music for everybody to dance to. Yeah. Uh, and we would do that kind of circuit. And that was a really good example of the style that he played. So big festivals here and there. A lot of county fairs, rodeos, and yeah. city city concerts, and things, and they're packed. I mean, everybody in towns you've never heard of, yeah. all over the place. <laughs> uh, and you know, how can there possibly be this many people that live in this area? But I'd, you know, everyone comes out. That's yeah. I, I know exactly what you mean. I lived in Alabama for about ten years, and it, it was in mm -hmm. a very rural area of a very rural state. And yeah, they had a, a big festival once a year, and they would have a, a fairly decent sized act come. And it's the same thing. And people come for for you know, counties wide, you know, right. like five, yeah. six counties away. They all come to this festival because it's the only thing going at that time. And they've got a, a and you recognize the name and you remember hearing it on the radio. Exactly. And you're going to go see that. Sh yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I didn't know yeah, exactly. I remember playing saying. this like crawdad festival in Louisiana <laughs> in Crown Bay. De Combray, I think is how you say it. Anyway, and it was like when we were setting up, it's like, is this it's like an abandoned fairgrounds yeah. kind of vibe, you know? And it was like, unimaginably hot mm. and we get all set up and then we go away just to hide in the air conditioning and come yeah. back out there's like ten thousand people here yep. at 10 30 at night it's no cooler at no. 10 30 at night and uh <laughs> like holy shit yeah so i mean yeah in some places down on the mexican border like you're like this is barely a town and yet there's a stage set up in the street which, you know, it's such a small town, even the stage blocking a street really isn't doing much of the traffic. Right. Yeah. Kind of, yeah exactly. <laughs> and yet, you know, at the end of the night, uh, yeah, like, wow, they're all over on the top of the buildings and like, hey, it was great. It was that a really was cool experience. You tour extensively in the U.S., a little bit of Canada. And the country seems great in its own way. I mean, I, I politically have some trouble with most of those people, yes. but uh, personally, <laughs> uh, but musically, it's phenomenal players. Yeah, and it is definitely. You know, my dad was a long haul truck driver, so I definitely grew up listening to all those songs. Oh yeah, and, yeah. So the, and there were some nostalgic moments there of like, man, I remember this as a child on the radio. Wow, singing along, and then now I'm mixing this. You know, it's, there was a lot of that. Absolutely. That's all. And uh, you know, the Peanut Festival in Dothan, Alabama, man, is just exactly. Like you described everything else. It's just nothing there. Boom. Stage in the middle of, of some right. fairgrounds. Yep. And then all of a sudden, everybody in, in the state, it seemed like, was there. It's, it's crazy. We played a Dodge City show where a tornado touched down in the distance. So we had to like, I mean, it was already oh, getting bad, the weather. And we were holding. And then it was like, can anyone, everyone was seeing that? And then you can start seeing like the fans and stuff that were from there were like scattering. We we're like. Yeah, boys, I think we need to get out of here. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, and we packed everything up in this pouring rain, and the bus driver just like going the opposite direction, which is not the way we're trying to go home, but who cares? Get just go the other way uh, kind of yeah. thing. And we had some of those and wow. various antics of buses breaking down and various things like that, of course. Uh, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. 
this is this has been awesome. I'd love to, this. I'd love to have you back on, and we can absolutely chat anytime. Some more. It's great. I, I mean, I can chat pontificate about whatever topic for hours. If you get me going on sound too, I, I, I won't <laughs> stop. You know, I <laughs> talk about the various faders and the things forever, and yeah, uh, well, I would or mix concepts and stuff. And you know, I could go through some black rebel stuff because i have multi tracks of them or some dandy stuff or anything else that i've got like you know full tracks of that's all right so that's uh, one thing i'm gonna tell you i am jealous see my dream is to be able to, to tour with a band for for it doesn't have to be the entire tour it could be a week and just shoot the whole week's worth the of whole shows. process yeah oh man Awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. Oh, my pleasure. Well, uh, let's stay in touch. And uh, like I said, next time, you come, next time you come to D.C., let me know in the uh, D.C. area, and I'll, I'll be there. All right, man. Talk to you soon. All right. Take care, man.